Thank you all for coming. This is, means a lot to me to be recognized for what I did at a time when I didn't think I was doing anything special. I was working. I was doing a job, raising a family, feeding my kids. And um, I never looked at it any other way. I never had an ego in any of it. I had an opportunity that I want to pass on to every single one of you in here today. And that is, when life gives you a challenge of any kind, don't walk away from it. I had an opportunity given to me when I was 25 years old, working in a bank, college graduate, starting a family. And I wasn't making enough money. I was renting a little house in Bel Air. And by the grace of God, no, the, the school newspaper at Bel Air and the Diamondback at University of Maryland, I wasn't cool enough to be on their staff. I was a sod buster. I was a hillbilly. I was a nerd. I had buck teeth and wore glasses. How much worse can it get? <laughs> but my daddy always told me, <laughs> you're a nature boy. You're going to be just fine. And I kept that in my head. And the job at the bank, manager of a bank in Churchville, across the street was Walter G. Cole. He was a director at the bank. I was the young hotshot. And uh, the two older guys that worked with me hated me. <laughs> they did not like me. Because I came in, I was from Bel Air, and I wasn't a homeboy. And the paper, the Aegis, came out once a week. And it was the gospel back then. They called it the gospel according to St. John. They did. That's what they called the paper. There were six other competing newspapers at that time. Six hard copy newspapers. And of course, the goal I was told later was top of the fold, front page picture, Todd, top of the fold. Well, they gave me the opportunity because one of their articles on a fire at a farm in Jarrettsville was wrong. I happened to be going up to Shackelford's fish farm that day with my kids, and um, I saw the fire, and it started in a dairy barn. It was an electrical fire. And the Aegis reported it was a silo, spontaneous combustion. And I'm telling the guys at the bank when we're reading the paper, you know, got to read the paper Thursday morning, big deal. And because I was the manager, I got to read the paper first. I got the cherry. They could look at it after I looked. It was so absurd. I, looking back on it now, it was comical. It wasn't comical to them. And it wasn't to me either, but today it is. Well, I saw the article about the fire, and I said, that's wrong. That, that isn't what happened. This is the God's truth. And Phil Weber and Berkeley Siegel were the two guys that were with me in the bank. And they said, well, why don't you call the paper and tell them what's what? As a dare. And I said, give me the phone book. And I called 838-4400. And I asked to speak to the editor. I didn't know who the editor was. And the next voice I heard was, Hello, this is John D. Worthington. Oh, Mr. Worthington. Well, you got an article that's not right on A6 of your front page paper. Well, what is wrong with the article? I said, it didn't start. He said, who is this? I said, Todd Holden. He said, you want a job? 
Now, you don't have to believe this, and I really don't care if you do or you don't. <laughs> it's the way it happened, and it's why I believe in karma totally. I said, I'm manager of the bank in Churchville. You go by the bank every day from Aquila Hall where you live. I've seen your car. Big Pontiac Grand Prix, big all chromy Pontiac station wagon. And he said, well, why don't you stop in? That changed my life. I went home that day and I said, you're not going to believe this, Ann. <laughs> Some weird shit coming down. <laughs> and she said, well, go talk to them. See what they say. And they offered me a part-time job. Why? Because that month, Peter J left the Aegis to go to cover the Vietnamese War for the Washington Post. They needed a reporter. Fate took a hand in my life. I never had any journalism training. Um, I walked into something and I, I took it on. And each of you, every one of you, when something comes up in life and you just, ah, oh man, I don't know, go for it. Because you'll kick yourself if you don't. You have to believe in yourself. Otherwise, nobody else is going to believe in you. So, to start this performance, I'd like to thank Mary. Where's Mary? Mary, who's running the PowerPoint. Tim, at the controls of the camera, and uh, Jackie, and Bill. God bless him. I don't know where he went. Is he here? Hey, Bill. Thank you for all your help today. Uh, we'll have questions at the end of this, if you have any. And I'm probably going to sit down because um, I got a bad wheel on me. Where's the little chair? Oh, here it is. Oh, here it is. Oh, okay. I almost fell over it, didn't I? Mm -hmm. Okay, here we go. Fasten your seat belts. Oh, yeah. 85, it feels good to sit down. Doesn't it, Joan? Okay. Do we have any questions before I start? Any questions at all? Oh, God. Oh, this. This is from the daughter of Dick Worthington at the Aegis. I know you're thinking, you know, what you get it to you to stick it in your throat. <laughs> but this is where all the copy I wrote ended up when I worked there. On a spike like this, and when the Aegis was sold, which began the downfall of the Aegis, in my humble opinion. Uh, we're going to talk about recalling the Aegis, a little column I started on Facebook that you all might want to look at because it traces the glory days of the Aegis. And it, it was an incredible time, the 60s, for me to get the job at that time. I walked into a really tumultuous country with race relations. Uh, women couldn't do certain things. Joan is well aware of that. Um, anyway, Ann Worthington, when she left for Arizona, which is where she is now. Hi, Todd. I want to give you a small gift because I absolutely love the articles that you write. I did not know your dad or your mom, but I remember my dad saying to my dad, he was really proud of that boy. I never heard my father say that to me while he was living. <laughs> but he said it to a lot of other people. And now I take, it's unreal. Uh, so out there, they have a few local papers. They're all drying up. Local news is a thing of the past. And if you want to know who had a baby, or well, the Aegis used to even have the divorces. And then the hungry 
readers that wanted scandal, that wasn't enough. They had to write separations before the divorces. So anyway, if anybody wants to check that out, be happy to do that. Ready for the first slide, Mary? All set? It was an absolutely foggy, yucky day when I walked into the Aegis newsroom and met with news editor Robbie Wallace, and with him was John D. Worthington III and his brother Dick. They offered congratulations on, the, on me joining their team. They handed me an Argus C4 camera, several rolls of film, a, a notebook, reporter's notebook, and they said, just get the name spelled correctly, and whenever you can, take a picture. That was it. I mean, can you put your head around what I'm being told at 25? Graduating from college was a big enough trauma for me. I got out of there with English literature and history, but just spell the names right. Okay. Now, along with that was a 24-hour monitor for my bedroom. And when it went off, I went off. And my goal was, if Robbie said, did you get the picture of this? Did you get the picture of that? The fire, this, the other. Yeah, I did. Then I'm okay. But no rays. The whole place was foreign to me. Can I read this? Is that okay for you? Is that, is that good? The whole place was foreign to me. I'd never been inside of a newspaper in my life. They showed me a little room next to the conference room. That was going to be my office. Herman Albright, who worked on the farm for John D. Worthington at what is now where the Bel Air Methodist Church is. Behind it, that was the mansion. Herman was a pressman, and because the farm was sold, he'd have been out of a job. So John D. said, we're going to make you a pressman. And that's why some of the issues of the Aegis, you needed Baraxo to clean your hands once you read it. Poor old Herman, if it was humid, he... He didn't quite get that down. Great guy. He says, well, we got a desk in the basement. It needs to be refinished, but it was the desk that John D. Jr. used when they were over on Cortland Street. Great. Big desk, beautiful desk. Coffee stains on it, water stains. Herman and I refinished my first desk. Brought it upstairs with a royal typewriter and a telephone, and Todd, good luck. That's where it all began. That's how simple it began. It wasn't convoluted and complicated. It was very simple. Next slide is supposed to be me talking at John Carroll. Let's hope and pray this doesn't get screwed up. There it is. Okay, they were real big at the Aegis on career day for all the high schools. So I got to go, being the new guy on this block, I got to go and talk about photojournalism, of which I knew nothing. <laughs> but I could talk, and the kids liked it, and I explained to them what I said to you earlier. The challenge, I gave it to myself. I didn't know what I was, I mean, I could have been there a month and said, I can't do this. I, I'm, I got to get out. But I didn't. It caught something in me, and it was like they let me alone. Hey, he's doing good with pictures. Leave him alone. And the circulation each week went up and up and up. It wasn't because of me. It was because of the turbulent times we were living in. We're talking 1965, 66, 67. So I've got the uh, monitor in the bedroom, which my wife wasn't real fond of, because 3 o'clock in the morning there's a barn fire. And it had codes that they would beep, beep, different three beeps meant something. And 
Then I learned the jargon of the state police. 1050, that's an accident. 1050 PI, that's an accident with personal injury. 1050 F, not good, but it sold papers. That's the long and the short, I'm just being honest about it. Guts and tragedy sold newspapers. And they couldn't wait on Thursday to get that copy and read what happened. Okay. On the other hand, I had 36 exposure. We rolled our own film. I've got some film here. I'll show you how we did it. We didn't buy film in the drugstore. We rolled our own out of 100 foot rolls. And on that roll of film might be a fire, might be a grin and grip with some politician opening a shopping center or a mall. Not a, not a mall. We didn't have malls back then. But other pictures, as I'm driving around, Sam Spicer on a tractor in Hickory, driving a tractor in the rain. Oh, I didn't make a good picture. There's a lot of farmers stopped, took a picture. And that led to another candid uh, that would be used as filler, which means as they wrote the paper out each week, they had gaps. And they'd have a big ad come in, Todd, we need filler, we need a picture, we need, we need something to fill in. And I had an assortment of human interest pictures that I would rather do than the blood and the guts and the politicians and the, you know, the blowhards. <laughs> the Aegis kept sending me to schools. This happens to be John Carroll, I think. Look how thin. Oh, it's breaking my heart. But I had hair on my face back then. My wife liked it. When she liked it, I'm in. Next slide. This is the image that changed my life. Two years at the paper, I'm sent to the Benson Barrack to do the Colonel's inspection. That's Colonel Lally. He came and inspected the troops. I get the money shot, which is him looking at the pistols. And I go to the back of the line, the back of the line where the W's and the S's and the T's, like Willie Willis. He's the guy waving. I always had a, my dad's camera. I, I, Got rid of the, the C4 was not much of a camera. My dad gave me a, a Leica M3, and I always kept it at F5.6, 50th of a second, pre-focused. I always kept it that way. And I'm standing there at my, with my camera down at my hip, and Willie Willis goes, hey, Todd, what's happening? <laughs> While the colonel is doing his thing, one click. Take it in, money pictures for the colonel, paper that we got this covered, the big deal. Todd, we can't use that picture. The, the cop waving, uh, we're not using that. We're, that means we're making fun of the police. Dick Worthington, that's a quote. I didn't care. I had enough, I had eight or nine other pictures in the paper, so I'm a happy guy. Okay, you're not using that one, so what? But, Three weeks later, Dick and his wife had a few racehorses running at Pimlico. She, she had horses, her and Al Reagan. And Wilson Johnson comes back and says, Todd, we need, we need filler, we need filler. Now Dick was at the race course with his <laughs> wife, Betty. Aha, let's find that one of the policemen waving. They ran it, three column, top of the fold, inside the uh, A section. The paper comes out, they get a call. Todd, we have a call from Harford Mutual, the vice president. What did I do? <laughs> I didn't take any pictures of Harford Mutual that week. It's John Malcolm. Todd, that picture is fantastic. You should send that to Life Magazine. What? Send it to Life Magazine? Well, everybody had Life. Life was a great newspaper at the time, for photographers especially. 
So Charlie Head and I made an 8x10 glossy and sent it to Life magazine. Well, about four days later, I got my first and only telegram in my life, and that's the telegram, asking permission if they could buy the rights to it and also for Russia. They had a Russian, and Stern was the German life, and they offered me, I think, $400, and that's a lot of money back then. And um, I said, yeah, sure. And that changed my life right there because I bought my first Nikon FDN. That was a center-weighted meter camera. And um, so another lucky break where somebody says no. Now, Dick comes back from the races. He doesn't know. Well, the paper ran that week, and he, he and John always read it through, and Dick comes back, and he always smoked a pipe. And he comes in my office, he says, uh-huh. Who put that in there? He was still pissed off about it. And I said, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. Wilson Johnson did it. You know, blame the other guy. Get out of it. Because Dick signed the checks. Okay. Well, that in two years up there, really, all of a sudden, everybody's calling me up. I'm an expert photographer. I'm nothing. I don't know what I'm doing. But I started with Bob Coombs at the sheriff's office. We started taking classes at night at Loyola from Ed Bafford and some other really great photographers. And um, I, guess in, I guess subconsciously, I realized I was going to give my life over to photography then at that time. I wasn't going to go back to a bank and be confined, and I wasn't going to teach. That was $4,900 a year to teach. And Clark Jones, who hired me, I never took the job. I took the bank job. But Clark Jones said, well, Todd, you only have to work nine months of the year for 49. I said, yeah, but what, what do I buy my groceries with the other three months? So I got part-time jobs, and that's how I did that. Next slide. Okay. John Amos at his mill up in Norrisville. This was a spontaneous thing, the kind of thing I lived for at that time, away from the blood and the guts and all the other we talked about. I uh, saw the mill falling down, and I stopped to take a picture of it. And I see this little old man. I walk over and said, howdy. He said, how are you? I said, what's your name? He said, John Amos. I said, yes, Mr. Amos. Nice to meet I didn't know who he was. I said, nice to meet you. Do you mind if I take a few pictures? Why would you want to take my picture? How many times have you heard that, Matt Button? <laughs> Why do you want to take my picture? Okay. Just don't blink and don't look in the camera. That's all I would say to him. I took the picture. It turns out when I get back, um, John Worthington told me, you know, John Amos, I think, is the oldest living miller in the state of Maryland at that time. I didn't know it. Again, serendipitous, stop, he's there. He could have been out in the back taking a leak and I never would have seen him. <laughs> but he was there. And, and things happen when you initiate a little bit. So, John Amos, the oldest miller, that picture, Dick didn't have any problem running that. Next slide. Ah, here we go. Uh, this was a fatal fire at Poe's Bar in uh, Cooptown. And um, I got called out about three o'clock in the morning and got up there and turned out one of Gene Poe's daughters and a little girl that was spending the weekend with them both died. Franny Poe, who still works the restaurant there, she's, she's survived, she got out. And while I was there, my, again, I'm self-taught. 
So when you get to the scene and you see the smoke and the fire trucks, right away I start shooting as I get close. I mean, I could get stonewalled, get back. You're not allowed any close. So get the shot. Get as many shots as you can before you get thrown out. Well, I didn't get thrown out. I started shooting the crowd. And it so happens the contact sheet on the bottom shows the two guys that set the fire. They stuck around after they were thrown out, and they're in my picture. Well, Danny Moore was an investigator for the state police. He said, Todd, can we see your pictures for our investigation? I said, sure. And then Gene Poe saw the pictures and said, those are the two guys I threw out. They're probably the ones that said it. And it turned out other witnesses, and they confessed, and they both got convicted. Uh, it was a double fatal. One of the guys was a boy named Wayne Boyle. He died in prison, and the black guy was John Henry, and he just was released. He'd served all of his time. But you never knew, and three days after this fire was the great Bel Air Groundhog Day fire when half a, well, a big portion of Main Street burned, and I was on top of Boyd and Fulford that day shooting pictures, and I covered in soot, and I kept throwing the film down to Charlie Head, who was a darkroom guy, and I'd start to get down off the roofs. No, no, Robbie wants you to stay up here till the fire's out. Throws up two more rolls of Tri-X, and I thought, oh God, and I came home that night, oh my Lord Jesus, my wife said, would you get in the shower, please? You stink of all the asbestos and all the burning ash in my hair. I didn't smell it because I was walking around with it all day. You've been there, haven't you? Okay, next, next slide. Do you want to see, is there any questions about the one we just had of, of uh, the, the Poe fire? Anything as we go along, if something hits you, put your hand up and, and we'll answer. This one, yeah, this is the actual fire day in Bel Air, the Groundhog Fire. But so many images that day were destroyed because the Aegis, in their infinite wisdom, kept all of our film, in. this is how it came, in a 100-foot roll, and then they would put it, when they were done, roll it back up, and they stored these in a humid, damp basement. And ultimately the emulsion solidified and made like grandmom's fruit preserves. So I'd say at that period of time, in the six years I was there, we did about 36,000 images, all told. And a lot of them today would be very valuable here at the Historical Society, and they're gone. I mean, just the way it was. I mean, the film belonged to the Aegis, unless it was things that I did on my own, and that was the policeman, and uh, uh, I can't think of any others right now. That was the biggest thing that ever happened to me at the time. Next picture. Okay, now we're back to reality. This is what sold newspapers. This was a collision down at Fountain Green. This is what they paid me for. This was the front page, top of the fold. The crowd, notice the people, notice the policemen starting to give mouth to mouth. Where was I? Why was I where I was when I took the picture? Now think about it. You get there, it's sad. I mean, as long as the camera was up here, I, I didn't have a lot of emotion. When the camera came down and you saw, that's when I got sick to my stomach. I, I didn't enjoy those kind of pictures at all. But you, I had the ability to get where I had to get Got the policeman, got the victim, got the car, got the crowd. And at that time, Audrey Bodine 
looked at my work one day and said, God damn boy, you got a natural instinct for photography. And that's the first time I ever heard that. And it didn't sound like, eh. But Audrey Bodin knew what he was talking about. Um, each week, again, the first commandment from the Worthingtons, from St. John, was front page, top of the fold. And, man, I was competitive. And a couple of the other photographers at the paper, Billy Whitman, Charlie Head, Again, like the two old geezers at the uh, bank, they hated my guts, because I was good. And my ego was getting a little bigger because the Aegis never gave credit lines to the pictures that before me and after me, they started giving them. But I wanted my name on that picture. I didn't care about money. I did that. And then I had Ronnie North. Did anybody in here know, remember Ronnie North? Ronnie North. Ronnie, you knew him. Ronnie was a real estate guy and kind of a bon vivant. He was a smart guy. He came in one day and said, you know, I made a bet at the bar the other night that I could identify every Todd Holden photograph in the Aegis. And I got 14 out of 20 that you took and I won $45. He said, I can tell when I look at the pictures, you took them. Now, I don't know how he did it. Uh, I, could, I could tell because mine were better than the other ones. <laughs> I thought they were better. Anyway, next picture. Yeah, this was a bad night. Um, this was a uh, precursor to the Rap Brown trial a lot of racial unrest, not so much in Bel Air. The black people that lived in Bel Air were as embarrassed about all this as the white people. It was the imported demonstrators with the Black Panthers that had the locals upset because if you were black, you were part of them. No, not really. The locals had to live here after the news media and after the trial was gone, they had to survive in this town on Alisan and William Street. But again, that night, I'm at the command post in the armory. Nothing's going on. It's a quiet night. They had sharpshooters on every building on Main Street. The First National Bank had two sharpshooters. Uh, the Commercial Savings had two sharpshooters. All the buildings around the courthouse, because the word was they were going to blow the courthouse up. Well, Mr. Featherstone and his friend came into Bel Air, saw all the police, and decided we're going back to D.C. And this is verified. This is not speculation. We didn't know it at the time, but it's what happened. As I'm leaving the command post, Otis Trost, a really good cop, says, we got all this coffee. You want a cup of coffee? Yeah, I'll have a cup of coffee. If I hadn't stayed there, I wouldn't have heard the explosion. What in the hell was that? Down we go, and the uh, bodies were uh, hanging in trees, and it was bad, bad, and um, it went off. They were trying to disarm it as they headed south, right where the Silver Spring Mining Company is now, the restaurant. That's where it happened. And if you notice, gas was how much? That's the killer. We, that's where history comes to bear in photographs. It's got nothing to do with the tragedy that happened, but... Gee whiz, gas was 33 cents a gallon. So, and Mr. Brown, the trial never happened in Bel Air because Harry Dyer, God bless him, he made a comment to the state police that there's no reason that Rap Brown couldn't get a fair trial in Harford County. And he talked to the press a little too much. Now we're talking national news, CBS, Walter Cronkite, Peter Jennings, 
the Aegis, um, I guess Robbie ran like everybody else that we were going to cover the trial, but um, the uh, Kunstler, William Kunstler, and next picture, that's William Kunstler on the right and the Black Panther leader on the left. Now, this is interesting. Again, here's the hayseed. Called for a hayseed? Back here. All the press, all the news media, worldwide, all the networks, all the TV. That's Peter Jennings on the right-hand side in the back, a young Peter Jennings. Walter Cronkite was in town talking to John. I'm thinking, why get out there and have the same shot that everybody's got? So I cuddled into the steps at the courthouse by myself. And out they come. Now, they were so well known. Don't worry about the faces. That tells the story. The story is the defendant's attorney and the leader of the opposition leaving the courthouse. And nobody gave me any trouble on that one getting in the paper. But it's again like the picture of the car wreck. Why was I back by the door? Something controls you when you're at a scene and your job is to get the images, to get the story, get it right. Next slide. Folks would line up at the back door on Tuesday nights to get the early run of the classifieds. They would come in by the drove and get the jump on others seeking to buy or sell that week's in the paper. Where's the car that's for sale? We saw an ad for a washing machine. It was incredible. It was like a black market thing on Tuesday night. The paper wasn't published till Wednesday, but we ran the classifieds uh, on Monday and, two, and sports. We ran those three early. Uh, the smell of printer's ink, again, permeated the back press rooms. There were nights when Robbie would not let us go home until we rode out. I would, if it was a heavy week with hard news, I might be able to get written out by two or three in the morning. And um, God bless my wife, I'd come home at 3 o'clock some nights, just devast write, write, just all this writing. And uh, writing cut lines as well for my pictures. And my wife, she's in bed, she's asleep, the kids are asleep. I tippy toe in. Of course, the monitor's on. And Ann would roll over and say, would you mind getting a shower and shampoo your hair? <laughs> Oh, Ann, I'm so tired. Honey, bunny, your head stinks like ink. Uh, and I don't know, because I'm walking around with it. So I'd go in the shower. Hmm. I don't look back at that fondly. I, I, that, I'm just as glad I moved on. Uh, adventures at the Aegis helped me prepare for many more adventures after I left and went on my own in photography. Um, I will always be grateful to the Worthington family and for Big R, Robbie, because they, they let me, I don't know, I, can you figure out a way to say it? They hired me, I could have been a failure. I could have been nothing. And they could have said, Christ, why did we hire him? But it worked. It's magical. I, it, it, there's no way to write it down and make it happen for other people. You make it happen yourself. And without other people who had the, had the open-mindedness to say, let him alone, Leave, let him go. And I had that with the Worthingtons and Robbie I never was politically aligned at the paper. I stayed out of that. I hated politics. And the big cigar chomping 
would come in and cloister with Robbie and the door would get closed and the Worthingtons and they would endorse candidates. I, I, I didn't get into that because I can't stand them. I'm not a political minded person because the majority, every now and then you have a nice guy, but the majority of them, one way or another, they're going to feather their own bed and to hell with the people. And early on, that's the way I believed. Next slide. No, it's just screwed up. There he is. What am I doing these days? Okay, that's John Worthington, one of the directors here at the Historical Society. I gave my son, a, uh, my son-in-law, a decoy, and I wanted John to write the provenance for it to authenticate it. He said, sure, I'll stop by and we can do it. So he's sitting there, he's got his magnifier, the decoy. What's happening? Can you tell me what's happening? The picture is telling me the story. Take a picture. This is the expert, the decoy, doing business. Now this is automatic every time I take a picture. This is how it happens. I see the composition, take the picture, and then that tells what the guy was doing. Do you agree? Do you, is there a question about that picture? No? All right, now the last slide, which is the big orange. There we go. That will conclude my talk. Um, it's what I believe in. It's about accepting a challenge, about uh, being given the opportunity. There's a lot of talented people out in this world, artists, writers, that never get anywhere because they never had the opportunity. They didn't have the chance. So when you get the chance, you got to step up and have the opportunity. That is the way things happen where we discover what we can do, what others can do. You all read all that? Because we're going to ask a question if, when we're done. <laughs> no, we're not. There are no questions. Um, uh, do we have any? I'm just for a second. Oh, that's no, no, no. There was one back there that wasn't clapping. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I don't know who you are. Who is it? I can't see. Steve oh, okay. oh, Steve. The light behind. Uh, that's a policeman. Yeah, I'm kind of good riding for state police and other stuff. Well, nice to see you. Um, you had a unique relationship with my father, Ted. Yeah. During all this turmoil, you guys. Well, they knew they could trust me that if they said something was off the record, it was off the record. And the reason I got along so well with the state police and the county sheriff was um, they had a job to do. And I had a job to do. And the late Sheriff William Kunkel said to me one day, they had a suicide of a prisoner in solitary at the jail when it was there on Cortland Street. And I was sent over we never wrote suicide. We never gave names for suicides. That was part of my respect for the family that maybe had nothing to do with the suicide. And I went over, heard that there was a suicide, da, 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 da. And Bill Kunkel said, I'll never forget this, ask me a specific question and I'll give you a specific answer. I'm not volunteering any information. I happen to know that the prisoner took the spring out of the mattress and made a noose, and that's how he hung himself. So I said, well, I understand it was the wire from the bed. Yes, that's all the answer I got. Now, did we run that story? No, but I needed to be satisfied what happened, because I knew about it, and I was a reporter. But you've got that inherent curiosity. 
That's the answer to that. And, and your father, whenever they would, they had a big drug raid. One of the first big drug raids in the state of Maryland was the Midway Inn. Uh, they had 40 different police from different agencies in Baltimore County, Harford County, and Cecil County. And I got a tip from a policeman um, that there was going to be a big drug raid. And uh, I thought, boy, this ought to be a, a big picture, and maybe I'll beat the other seven newspapers. And uh, went down to the Club 40, Midway Inn, and uh, I was so scared, okay? I didn't carry a gun. I didn't have a gun permit or any of that stuff. But I went to Quincy Edwards, a real good friend of mine. And I said, Quincy, can I borrow a car tonight? Borrow a car? What, you got a hot date? No, no. He gave me a yellow Mercury Cougar. And I didn't use my, my car was a Beetle. I had a Sahara Beige Volkswagen. And um, I took this car, and across from the Midway Inn and the, and the Club 40 was a golf driving range. And you could pull right up, and I pulled up, and I thought, well, they told me this was the night, and I waited two hours. Nothing happened. But I saw this guy come out of the Club 40 to the payphone. <clears throat> saw the same guy four or five times. Come down, goes back. Well, that was the uh, informant, whatever you call him. And I'm sitting there. And all of a sudden, two rows, cop cars, Route 40, westbound. I thought, oh my God, and I got goosebumps now thinking about it. They circled the building with police cars, and the raid was on. And no other newspapers were there but numero uno. <laughs> Front page top of the fold. <laughs> and Doc Winter, who owned the Havity Grace Record, uh, Wilmer Cronin owned the Harford Democrat. Um, they raised all kinds of hell with the state police. How come Holden was there? How, why was he there? I was lucky. I had an informant, and I didn't roll over on the informant. I never let on who the policeman was that told me. But that's, that's, that's competition. Man, that goes on all the time at Exxon and Netflix and Facebook, all these big corporations. Okay. And another question? Yeah. Oh, I was just commenting the, the picture of uh, the guys that, that blew up in the car around the corner. That was uh, Twin Kiss. Yeah. And then Yep. The picture of uh, the fire in Bel Air and the home. My mother used to duck pin bow in the back of the home. Yep. Tommy Brown and I used to set pins there. <laughs> yeah. so, a dollar a night. <laughs> and For those of you who didn't hear the question, she commented that around the corner from where the oh, explosion yeah. occurred was the twin kiss. Right. And that your mother used to bowl in the hole. Duck pins. Yeah, duck pin bowling. Duck pin bowling. Tommy Brummel became a fire marshal, police chief in Bel Air, a uh, big volunteer fireman, hell of a good friend. My same age as me, and his daddy died when he was about six, and we sort of adopted him. He came to our house all the time, and we played together, and then he became a cop, and it kind of stretched things with me and him, but he he again was a policeman that could trust me. Todd, I, we can't write this, but this is what happened. He would satisfy my curiosity so I could move on. And so you don't write it. Any other questions? Uh, Yo, Matt. Oh, Matt. Go ahead, Matt. I don't necessarily have a question, but I have to say, I appreciate the work that you do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, God bless you for saying that. Well, I, I mean that. Thank you so much, my friend.
I'm not going to have pallbearers when I die. It's going to be ashes, but you can carry my casket anytime. Thank you, sir. But what, it, what Matt's saying is, uh, this is, I don't know what I'm getting across. I always consider myself a failure if I don't reach everybody in the room. And I, maybe I didn't reach all of you today. And for that, I feel I failed. But you have to understand, the message of the whole thing is I was given an opportunity at the paper. And it was a good paper long before I ever got the job there. It was a good newspaper. It was a good newspaper while I was there. It was a good newspaper after I left. The times, computers, things change. But I want you to go away from here today understanding in life, my life is the same as your life. We've all got little bumps in the road. I've had some tragedy in my life and I've made it through and you all can make it through as well. Um, Oh, that's right, I did. Oh, I forgot that. Uh, yeah, uh, Mr. Johnny on the spot here. I didn't know Mr. they get in the car, they throw rice, tin cans and shit. No, he has a helicopter land at the east wind. The helicopter takes him away. I don't know there's a helicopter coming. Todd, I think the bride and groom are leaving. Oh, my God. If I wasn't on Valium back then, if they had Valium, I'd have been on it. Um, any other questions? Any other comments? Yeah, Peggy. Yeah, yeah. One of those was of my soon to be 60 year old son when he was about seven with two other kids sitting on a curb eating their Halloween candy. And it was just, hey, that's my son. Oh, that's awesome. That is awesome. That I think that the locals really appreciate. Well, I did a lot of that because I liked children. Mm -hmm. I had two of my own. And people between 10 and 50 lie. <laughs> if they're under 10 and over 50 or 60, that's pretty much the most truthful people you'll ever deal with. <laughs> At least that's my experience. And when you see a bunch of little kids, if they were eating candy or, or playing hula hoop, mm -hmm. uh, I'd stop and just, because that, to me, sold as many papers as blood and guts and the bad, ugly stuff. Now, I, I will tell you that you made, there was also a picture of my brother and a couple of kids crossing the street to go to Valor Elementary School. My mother sent that picture, a copy of that paper to her brother and said, my son made the front page of the paper, what are your boys doing? <laughs> But the key thing is, remember, let's say it all together, front page, top of the fold. This was at the bottom of the fold. Uh, no, no, don't, you, you don't but say was, that. But it was the front page. And that was all the right, that, because, man, if they, w there was Bill Whitman, Charlie Head, Robbie, Donald Holmes, um, and every now and then they'd take pictures, and, and if I got beat out, I was crushed. I mean, I just was like, oh, I didn't get front page. But now, in, with that in mind, some of you aren't on Facebook, but if you are, a couple years ago, some friends and I were talking at the house how the Aegis is failing. Let's just call a spade a spade. Yeah. It, they're failing. There's no more local news. It, it, it's Matt's pictures were always great, but... Uh, it, it wasn't the same. So, I went to a artist friend, Frank Kelly. God rest his soul, Frank passed away. But I said, can you draw an old beat up sign that says the Aegis, like battered, like Don Quixote, <laughs> okay? With the battered up windmill. That's what I was seeing in my head. And we're going to start a column called 
recalling the aegis, the great days, the good days, the good pictures, the great articles, the apple butter festival. I mean, my God, the apple butter festival at Mount Nebo Church in Delta was big news back then to a lot of people. It wasn't about money. It wasn't about death. It wasn't about politics. But the community would get in line to buy apple butter from Mount Nebo Church. Now, I write a column still for the Delta Star. I've written it for 37 years. And they've got all, they used to be laughed at. But they've got the local news, the kids that are on the honor roll, the Apple Butter Festival, the Volunteer Fire Company, Fireman of the Year. The Aegis didn't have any of that anymore. Now, some people say, well, who gives a shit? Well, the people that work in the community that volunteer, they care. They all care. So do yourself a favor. If you're on Facebook, look at Recalling the Aegis. Go to that. And you have, to, you have to answer a question to get on it. The question is, what was your favorite part of the Aegis? Most of them, now we'll get to this as a wrap up maybe. Do you, how many here read the Aegis back in the glory day? Show of hands. Okay, there's enough of you that did. Robbie Wallace and I had a column on the back page bottom of the fold called here and there around the county and it was a dangerous column because it was kind of the dirt that went on that you didn't write as news but it was things that were going on to wit i will give you an example saint margaret had a young priest by the name of father warner and he fell in love with one of the nuns sister Sister Philip Mary. Thank you, Lucas. I didn't, I knew Father Warner, but I didn't know Sister, what is it again? Philip Mary. Philip Mary. I didn't know her. Beautiful young lady. Well, as time went on, this, there was a, the King Catholic of St. Margaret back then was Clarence Jernt. He was a, like a Nazi with religion. Uh, strange man. Don't say anything about the Catholics to him. No, okay, back away. Well, Father Warner fell in love, and they eloped, and they left town under cover of darkness one night. Well, of course, Robbie heard about it. I didn't hear, I was the last one to hear gossip. I never heard any of that. But we come in, and John and Dick, I hear about Father Warner, <laughs> well, yeah. So I wrote a here and there that week. And boy, did I catch hell for it. <laughs> but I had a sense of humor, and it had to get out, but I couldn't get it in the column. I couldn't get it. The only place for me to have an outlet was the here and there column, right? Okay, here's what it was. I remember verbatim. A group of parishioners were seen Friday night after confession, standing on Hickory Avenue, singing, wedding bells are breaking up that old gang of mine. <laughs> Woo! Boy, did that set them off. John finally said, you better get the hell out of here. Do you have anything you can do on the road? I, yeah, I'm out. And I got the hell out. And Jerk came in, wanted, demanded. And of course, Robbie, being the news editor, rolled over on me. <laughs> it was him, it was him, it wasn't me. And um, I got chewed out by Clint. I, I took my medicine. I, I, uh, he yelled and screamed, and I kept thinking, dear God, I hope Donald Holmes comes in, because if he has a heart attack, they're going to blame me. <laughs> but I thought it was funny. And as time went on, I saw Father Warner at Frank Kelly's funeral. And he and I are still friends. And he thought it was hysterical. <laughs> so see, the proof's in the pudding later on. Uh, 
you take a lot of heat at the time when you're innovative and on the edge. And then as the years go by, it's not a big deal. It was funny. Any other questions? No? Are we? Yes? You want to date with me, don't you? I can tell by the look in your eye. Where did I go? Yeah, what, what company did you after that? Well, I, okay, we'll give you the backstory on that. Annie Worthington, widow of John D. Jr., sewed up everything so nobody could break the trust and get into the money of the, uh, the Aegis, also known as Homestead Publishing. I wanted a piece of the action. I was good after six years. A paycheck's fine, but how do I become part of the Aegis? One of the guys in the conference room. Now, I, that's how, well, at that time, 1972 is when I left. I was um, 32 years old. And uh, I was told by Robbie, it's sewed up. There is no way the Worthingtons have got it locked up. I, Robbie couldn't even get an interest in the paper. Instead, because of the tremendous job he did, he was liked and hated. I'm not going to get into that. That was all political. He was given shares of stock in radio station WVOB that the Aegis owned. That's how they kissed him. My kiss at the end of every year was a $500 bonus. They never bought me a camera, a lens, or anything. Strobes, when they came out, no more Press 25, Blue Dot, Sylvania. I had to buy my own strobe. But that's the way it was, and I'm not bitching about it. That was the way the game was played, so no big deal. But I thought, as hard as I was working, I want a piece of the action. And that's when I decided, if I'm going to make a life for my wife and my kids, I'm, I'm good, so maybe I can make it on my own as a photographer. And I, I, uh, I had a friend give me some LSD. Um, <laughs> Uh, he, he, uh, they called him the Cosmic Commander. He was from Havity Grace. It was Owsley Acid. I dropped it on Easter Sunday, 1972. Went into the den and wrote a letter of resignation that afternoon. I gave the letter of resignation to Dick Worthington. He said, you're making a big mistake. You got a wife and two kids. I said, maybe it's a mistake, but I got to do it. I'm sorry. My parents were in the Bahamas at the time. I always called them on Easter Sunday. I called. My father wouldn't talk on the phone. He answers the phone. He's a lawyer. He answers the phone. Yeah, what's up, Toddy? Well, Dad, just want to say hi to you and Mom. Um, thinking about uh, leaving the Aegis. What? <laughs> Jesus Christ, Todd. Here, Gene, talk to him. Hands the phone to my mother. My mother, hey, Toddy, what's up? Oh, Mom, how you doing? Down there. I'm going to leave the Aegis. I'm going to start my own business. Now, I'm tripping my ass off when I say this. And my mother says, well, you just go right ahead. I never expected her to say that. She says, you just go right ahead. They're a little stingy. You can do it, and if you ever have any problem, we'll help you with the kids. That's a hillbilly mother from Sparta, North Carolina, talking to her son, and I'm proud of it. So that's, the, the rest is history. I, I latched on to a couple uh, politicians. The first one was Charlie Anderson when he ran for county executive. He hired me to do his campaign because I, he's had the track record from the Aegis, and now I'm on my own, so he hired me, 
Uh, John O'Neill hired me. Um, Tommy Hatem hired me. These were the people I could not stand when I worked at the paper. And now they're feeding me and my family. How screwed up is that? But that's life. The opportunity is there. Roll with it. And, and I don't look back. Um, I love the state police. Lieutenant Hanley was the big kingpin down there. And he and I would go round and around. There was a cougar that was killing cattle in the county. I latched onto that big time. And he called me in one day. He had a blue vein up here in his head. And he, he called the Edith and said, send Holden down to the barrack. And Robbie, again, rolled over. You better go down and talk to Lieutenant Hanley. Oh, Christ, what now? So I go down, and the blue vein was already sticking out in his head. And he said, why are you wasting my troopers on this cougar thing? It's bullshit. There is no cougar. I said, now, wait a minute. You tell that to the farmers that have had ponies and calves eaten or killed. And then he turns around as I left. I was scared to death of that man. Number one, he had a gun <laughs> and a blue vein popping out in his head. That's enough to get my attention. But as I went out the hallway at the barrack, he said, you know, Holden, this is God's memory giving me a chance. You're the best public relations the state police ever had because of what you write and you're always fair to us. And it also went back to the state trooper in Life magazine, um, support your jovial police. And that would never have made it if it hadn't been for Dick running a horse at Pimlico. <laughs> now, you, you, you can't connect the dots. Come on, folks. Let's connect the dots. Remember the movies when you'd go and follow the dots and you'd sing in the Bel Air Theater? Follow the dots. Any other question? Yes. Did that answer your question? Okay. Anything else? If not, I'm done. Thank you all for coming.